Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony Paniagua, and welcome to AZ Illustrated Nature. Georgia Davis is out tonight. Coming up next, we'll tell you about an event where you can see some handmade creations from local residents. They are foregoing stores and imported items and helping the environment in the process. Also, you'll hear from local professionals who are excited about a new tri-national agreement to help monarch butterflies, an impressive migratory insect. But first, here's a look at tonight's headlines. U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel announced this afternoon he's recommending the A-10 aircraft be mothballed. The recommendation is part of the Pentagon's 2015 budget request to Congress. Hagel said cutting the plane will save $3.5 billion. More than 70 A-10s are based at davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson. The request was also made last year, and it must be approved by Congress and the President. The Augusta Resources Board of Directors is urging shareholders to reject the unsolicited bid by mining company HUD Bay to buy up shares of Augusta. Augusta Resources is the parent company of Rosemont Copper, which wants to open a large mine southeast of Tucson. This morning during a conference call with shareholders, financial analysts, and the media, Augusta President and CEO Gil Clausen said the HUD Bay bid is opportunistic and financially inadequate. The U.S. Supreme Court today rejected a bid by Arizona to cut off public funding for Planned Parenthood and other health providers that perform abortions. Without comment, the nation's highest court declined to hear the state's appeal to overturn a lower court decision that blocked that law. And this afternoon, the Arizona Senate officially sent SB 1062 to Governor Brewer. The bill allows businesses to refuse service to anyone based on religious grounds. After the bill was transmitted to Brewer, a group of Senate Democrats spoke on the floor of the chamber, asking Brewer to veto that proposal. She has until the end of the week to act. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. This Saturday, March 1st, residents in Tucson are holding the first ever Megtopolis event in the city. The goal is to highlight a growing movement around the world in which people are joining forces to build things, objects they want or need in their lives. Next, we'll take you to a couple of places that are helping creative and curious residents accomplish their goals with the added benefit of helping the environment. The historic Bates Mansion in downtown Tucson used to be home to a private club, but now this building is welcoming members of the public from all types of different backgrounds. This is where you can find the Maker House. It's a cooperative organization for people who want to make things, learn new skills, or add to their education. The service is really, you have an idea and we show you how to execute it. Matt Rios has always been interested in crafting and creating. He even used to teach free welding classes in his own backyard. But now he's working at the Maker House as the program manager. Rio says there are plenty of things you can learn here, but one of the most popular attractions focuses on this laser printer. It's a state-of-the-art machine that allows its users to incorporate modern technology with tried and tested ideas. Would you like a logo for your company, for example? With the proper training and materials, you can transfer that computer image to a piece of wood that you can hang or give as a present. Or perhaps you can engrave it on your mobile telephone case and carry it in your pocket. This is completely cut on the laser. Rio says whatever the object might be, many people are attracted to making it themselves. The maker community is, it's exploding across the U.S. right now. My personal belief of why these are popping up so quickly is because you have arts and trade classes and things like that being cut from public schools every day and the community needs those things. And so now what's happening is people are putting a bunch of tools in a room with someone there that can teach other people how to do it, and they're, you know, it's organically coming up that way. And he says there are environmental benefits as well. Many items that may have been thrown away and ended up in a landfill are forming the building blocks for new creations. This bicycle rack at the Maker House's patio is a case in point. Volunteers worked on it with Bikas, another organization that teaches valuable skills. Bikas contributed bicycle frames, rims, and other materials. We put this thing together. We had no idea what it was going to look like when we started and just started laying things out and 
uh, you know, Bicus had a lot of creative input since this is kind of what they do down there. And uh, it's fantastic. It came out great. Across the street from the Maker House, the ZeroCraft hacker space is also committed to learning by doing. And these are the basics of a lot of the robotics that are used these days. This warehouse is being used by inventors and builders, hackers in the traditional sense, not what you may have heard when referring to computer hackers who break into other people's accounts. It's more of the old, the old term of when you hack something together, where um, you make something work, uh, or you put something together that wasn't meant to be together in the first place and get it to do something you want it to do, whether it's repairing something or making something new. And there are plenty of options here. They run the gamut from traditional to modern. The hackerspace is designed to provide a lot of tools and, and resources available for people to use. Dale Tercy is one of the group's founding members. So this is our 3D printing area. What we have here is an ultraviolet printer. The ultraviolet printer uses um, an ultraviolet projection from below and an ultraviolet setting polymer fluid. It's very much like what the dentist uses when they uh, make fillings these days that are non-metallic. They hit it with an ultraviolet light and solid solidify it. A classic example of the 3D image that they print is this plastic bust that was one of our members. Now this is part of our electronics area where we basically maintain a lot of our diagnostic tools and our equipment for building various electronic circuits, teaching people how to build circuits, modify circuits. This is a metal shop. We have um, a wonderful old Bridgeport mill for actually milling metal into shapes of what you might want to build for tools and gearing and all sorts of other parts. We have a wonderful uh, 1950s vintage lathe that will do pieces of steel up to 36 inches long. Other classes include a wood shop and even beer making lessons in a small kitchenette. As in similar spaces elsewhere around the nation, one of the philosophies involves upcycling, recycling materials to create useful items. We get lots of donations and we try and uh, put everything we can uh, to use. We get uh, you know, donations of like these air pumps and uh, we have this a, a little water cooler here that uh, we took apart because uh, it's got usable parts in it and uh, these are just available for people to use, you know, to, f to complete their projects. Jeremy Brittle also likes to make things, so when he heard about this group in 2012, he decided to get involved. While attending the weekly steering meetings for ZeroCraft Hackerspace, Brittle heard there was an opening for treasurer of the board, so he jumped on the opportunity. I had heard of, of Hackerspaces before, and I thought they were really cool, and um, I wanted to start one of my own, but I knew absolutely no one who would, who would be interested in doing it. And then when I found out that there was one in Tucson already, I thought, oh, that's amazing. I have to be a part of this. Back at the Maker House, Matt Rios is excited about the building your own enthusiasm. He says it's allowing participants to get more acquainted with each other and their communities. For example, most of the beer you can buy here is local, as are the bakery items and even the music in this jukebox. After all, the musicians are also creators, musical builders who are crafting compositions for others to enjoy. It's only local music. If you're not from Southern Arizona, you don't get in the box. And people have had a blast coming in and they're exploring the local sound of Tucson because they're just, they'll, you know, we'll have people come in just randomly punch in numbers now just to explore something new. Now we are joined by a couple of guests who have more information about the Metopolis event this Saturday, March 1st. Vanessa Ford is the executive director of the Maker House, and Connor Barrickman is the president and co-founder of ZeroCraft. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's begin with a little bit of the history of each of these two organizations. Uh, Vanessa, what about the Maker House? What would you like to say? Maker House was founded last April-ish, when we got the idea to put it together. We opened in October of 2013, and we're on a roll. Okay, and it seems to be growing. We'll talk about the membership Absolutely. and the growth. And what about you, Connor? What would you like to say about ZeroCraft? Uh, ZeroCraft is a makerspace, hackerspace organization founded in 2011, really grassroots organization. Started out of a, sh uh, a shed in downtown Tucson and has continued to grow and expand and gain support. 
Okay, so obviously we're talking about people who are making things or making things at the moment. So you brought a couple of items here, Vanessa. What do you want to tell us I about uh, the one that is closest to me right here first? This was made by our coffee bar manager, Allie Holler. Uh, he likes to call himself the Martha Stewart of hacking. So this is a repurposed spice rack for electrical components. He's got a key up here that tells him where everything is. Um, somebody from Raytheon was in the other day and said, wow, that's really brilliant. <laughs> So simple yet brilliant, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then this was made by our program manager, Matt Rios, out of a recycled lamp base, recycled vanity parts, and of course, recycled bones. Okay. And Connor, what would you like to say about the uh, object you have there in front of you? I brought in a piece of found art that one of our uh, members has put together. So this started as some metal scrap from the scrapyard, and they brought it in and welded and plasma cut and manipulated this into this uh, into this beautiful metal rose. Okay, and you also have a board with some other examples uh, yes. as well. So here's some more found art. This started as copper roof flashing and um, one of our members put together these molds and then pressed them together in a hydraulic press and uh, came up with these fascinating pieces of art. Okay, great. So let's talk about the environmental benefits of people who are making things on their own, Vanessa and Connor. Obviously, not everything can be new, and people, or not everything can be used, and people have to get new items in order to make their objects, but it seems like more and more people are paying attention to the possibility of recycling. Absolutely, and I think more and more people looking at objects that would normally go into the landfill and saying, okay, how can I extend this beyond its original purpose? How can I take its component parts, break those out, and use them in my projects? Okay, and, and Connor, uh, what about that concept of recycling or reusing items? Yeah, the uh, recycling and upcycling, taking stuff that was destined for the scrapyard and using it in a way that it wasn't designed is you know, one of the core values of the, of the maker movement, and it's something that we all uh, find very, very important. So let's talk about that maker movement. Uh, was it this popular a few years ago? Uh, honestly, I have to confess, this is about the, the last couple of months is when I first heard about it. And is it, but it's thriving in other cities as well. Uh, Connor, let's hear it from you. Yes, so the, we've taken a page out of, um, out of the San Francisco book that the maker movement uh, really saw resurgence in San Francisco and has grown um, across the country and really takes on the, the local flavor. So each, each little maker community is uh, representative of its city. And what about you, Vanessa? What would you like to say about that? And, and was, it, was there a discussion that you had, let's do something like that, or did, is, did it just come up uh, from normal Well, the people? Maker Movement actually has been around for about 10 years now. It's in response to the fact that our educational system is still an industrial age model, and we're now in the information age. And what employers are looking for are people who can look at systems, analyze and understand complete systems, and that's what the maker movement helps us do. Um, we can go in, learn how to build something, and then understand that system as a whole. And the more you work with systems and understand them, the more you can apply them. Okay, and Connor, you're a mechanical engineer, so how satisfying is it for you to see other people trying to make things? Maybe not as good as a mechanical engineer, but... Uh, uh, no, you know, oh. it, <laughs> it is great. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the, the standard mechanical engineer they don't get their hands on stuff. They don't get to make things. They don't get to put stuff together. And to see, um, to see people coming in and doing this applied technology and applied sciences is, is something else. And philosophically, what do you think about this whole movement, uh, Vanessa? I think it's wonderful. Uh, I watch my 16-year-old daughter go from, I don't know anything about technology to the last six or months or so she's been exposed to this and now she knows quite a bit. Now she's excited about it. It doesn't scare her anymore. And that's, I think, part of what people need to understand is that you're a maker no matter what you make. If you bake a cake, you're understanding that cake's system. If you crochet, you understand patterns and the system. So you need to, I think, move beyond the fear to getting your hands dirty and understanding that you can do things like that. Do you find that it's good for the soul, good for the mind, uh, for self-esteem? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it's really empowering to have people come in and do something that they never thought they could do, whether they wouldn't have access to those tools or uh, instruction on how to do that task. So it's, it's great to see. All right. And then finally, before we go, let's talk about Make Taupolis, yes. the event, when and where? It's March 1st, 10 to 4 in downtown Tucson. It's going to be in Zero Craft. 
at Maker House and in the Franklin parking lot, which is right between the two of us. And that's right by the railroad tracks, that's right? That's correct. Okay, well, excellent, and it's free and open to the public. Free and open to the public. All right, well, thank you very much, Vanessa and Connor, and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. What exactly is the TPP? We explain the major trade deal in the works with Asia. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. Beck didn't pick up on the mood of his new album until it was almost done. Woke up this morning. I just noticed that there were certain recurring things the morning, the sense of light coming, waking from uh, maybe a tumultuous time. I'm David Green. The tumultuous times that led to Beck's new album, Morning Phase, on the next Morning Edition from NPR News. When you hear about trinational discussions or agreements between Canada, the United States, and Mexico, they usually involve traditional geopolitical topics such as commerce, energy, or immigration. However, the three countries are now taking steps to help a very interesting and popular insect. The monarch butterfly is a resident of North America, does not recognize borders, but it is very dependent on the three nations for its survival. We are joined by three guests to talk more about monarch butterflies and the new agreement. Laura Lopez Hoffman is an assistant professor in the Udall Center for Studies in Public Policy at the University of Arizona and the School of Natural Resources in the Environment. Allison Demon is an author who also works as a professor and director of the Creative Writing Program at the University. And Gary Polnapan is an endowed chair at the University of Arizona's Southwest Center. Thanks for being here. Good to Thanks. be with you. Thank you. So let's begin with Laura, you and your interest in the monarch butterfly. How did this come about? Um, I am a conservation biologist, so I work on trying to conserve species, and I'm particularly interested in the monarch and a number of other species that migrate between the three countries. And you have a popular plant there that is essential for their survival. Can you tell us about that, I have place? a very special plant. This is Asclepius, also known as the uh, milkweed, and it is um, one of the primary food sources for monarchs as they migrate north from Mexico into the United States and Canada. Okay, and Gary Polnapan, obviously a lot of people have heard about you because of your research when it comes to food and sustainable systems and so on. Why this interest in the butterfly itself? Well, it's one of many uh, animals that is essential to our food security and the health of our agricultural lands is indicated by its health. And so we're working hard on solutions to keep milkweeds and monarch butterflies passing through American farmlands. Okay, and then Allison, you are a poet and a writer, and people might say, well, what does that have to do with monarch butterflies? What do you want to tell us about that? Well, I actually saw the monarchs in Santa Cruz for the first time in California, and I was so inspired by their migration behavior that I ended up writing an entire book of poetry inspired by the monarch butterfly. After that, I did a great deal of research, both in Mexico and in the U.S., and I found that this insect is so inspiring because of its skillful abilities to migrate and because of its beauty and because of its capacity to metamorphose. So it has remarkable properties that make us all love it. And I believe for conservation, love is an important element. Dr. Navan, what would you like to say about what was decided here in Mexico recently, just last week? Well, uh, the three leaders of Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. agreed on an historic uh, monarch recovery agreement. They will bring together a recovery team to figure out new strategies that will help monarchs and their host plants, milkweeds, and other wildflowers on the ground. And many of us will be involved in planting milkweeds from school children to uh, elderly uh, volunteers uh, to those of us in the university here. And Dr. Lopez Hoffman, you've done some surveys, some research about how people feel about this insect, and what, what are the answers so far that you're getting? Uh, so last year I was a part of a group of scientists that surveyed uh, over 2,000 people in the United States. It was a Harris poll, so a national well-recognized pollster. Over 70% of people in this country would be willing to pay money to protect the monarchs. Why do you think that is? Why are people giving that answer? Um, well, you know, that was a very surprising because nobody had ever demonstrated so much love, as Allison put it, for an insect. Um, it's an amazing insect. So the monarchs that leave Mexico um, and migrate northwards 
are not the same ones that come back. It's, their, it's three generations later. And that's just pretty amazing how the grandchildren of the monarchs that left Mexico can navigate their way back across a large continent to the same very small location in Mexico to spend the winter. Okay, and, and Asin, are you hoping people get inspired by your inspiration and other people's inspirations? You were mentioning a, a Mexican poet as well. Yes, one of the people who's been very helpful in advancing this trinational agreement is Omero Arigis. He's a prominent Mexican poet, and he and his wife, Betty Ferber, have been very involved in working on the advocacy for this and inspiring others to put their voices forward so that we can increase the milkweed corridors around the United States, so that we can make sure there's a protected route for them to follow on this amazing journey that they take. So I do want to say that writers from Canada to the U.S. to Mexico have been very important in helping to raise the profile of this insect and what's at stake for it. And when I spoke to you last week, uh, Gary Polnapp, I mean, you mentioned that there was a letter writing effort uh, that, uh, in which participants from the University of Arizona took part? That's right, about a dozen of us here at the University of Arizona in an educational and scientific role uh, signed the letter from 125 scientists and thought leaders around the world. And so we're very proud of U of A's role in this and will be part of a, a day of action and contemplation for monarchs and other pollinators April 14th that's based here in Tucson but touching the entire country. And we were talking ahead of this interview, uh, Dr. Hoffman, about how we hear so much about the inability of countries to get things done. This is an example of them being able to accomplish something. Why, wh why do you think that this is a good example for others? Uh, the um, president of Mexico, when the agreement was announced, said something that I thought was really beautiful. He said, the monarch integrates us. It's just so obviously, it's not just a symbol. Mm -hmm. It actually integrates us. So what happens in, in Canada uh, regarding policies about treating this really beautiful plant as a noxious weed impacts people in Mexico ability to see the monarch. And so I think that in recognition of A, how beautiful it is, B, how much people love it, and see how it really integrates us and how what we do in one country can really affect people and their ability to see monarchs in another country made it, I think, obvious and very easy for the presidents to take action on this. So this is not something trivial, as you said earlier, Allison. It's not. We need inspiration and we need examples of how we can cooperate and we need examples of ideas that make it easier for us to cooperate. And so I think that we, we want to remember, as Gary's uh, told us in so many eloquent ways over the years, that the pollination of our agricultural crops is a very important element for us to think about in terms of our food security. So this is one way for us to look cooperatively about doing something positive and solution-based to help protect those agricultural lands as well as the monarchs. Okay, and if somebody is watching this interview, uh, Gary Polnapan, and they get inspired to do something, what can they do? We only have about 30 seconds. Plant milkweeds, tag monarchs, report where you see monarchs in the U.S. and Mexico, and get that into Monarch Watch and Journey North. Okay, and of course, don't kill the caterpillars because they're feeding on the, <laughs> on the milkweed, and they'll turn eventually into the uh, butterfly. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. It's thank a you. pleasure. Thank you. Our mild winter and spring temperatures are a great time to explore the Sonoran Desert and nearby regions. And tonight we take you west to California. This is where you can find the Salton Sea. It's in the Colorado Desert of Imperial and Riverside counties and a popular destination for those who like nature. This segment is produced by Tom Gillespie and edited by Steve Bayless. At 227 feet below sea level, the Salton Sea is one of the lowest spots on Earth. While called a sea, it also happens to be California's largest lake and home to the Sunny Bono Salton Sea National Wildlife Refuge. Most of the wildlife taking refuge there are birds. This National Wildlife Refuge has documented over 424 bird species. That's a tremendous number for, for any single area across the North America. Uh, among other National Wildlife Refuges uh, that I'm familiar with, uh, it's more than any other refuge in the whole country. The Salton Sea is a hot spot, literally, and not just for bird watching. Located above active seismic features, its shore is dotted with evidence of the escaping tectonic heat. 
but it's hot in other ways too. Located in the Sonoran Desert, the Salton Sea is in all senses of the word, a desert lake. Rainfall is, is sporadic. It's nothing to be counted on. Uh, on average, over the decades, it probably averages about two to three inches a year. Uh, we're among the, the, the lowest rainfall averages in, in, in the U.S. Summer, I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, are around 115 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for a sustained period. Uh, we can get as hot as 120 degrees. Winters are very mild, and so we, we uh, are a wintering destination for a, a lot of bird species uh, from northern latitudes. Those desert conditions contribute to another of the Salton Sea's characteristically distinctive traits, the salinity of the water. The Salton Sea is getting saltier. Uh, nutrients are accumulating. Uh, it's at about 52 parts per thousand salt. Uh, the Pacific Ocean is about 35 parts per thousand, so it's getting uh, significantly saltier than, than uh, normal marine habitats. But it's still a good destination for birds. Uh, they're still able to find ample uh, habitat, healthy habitat here at the Salton Sea. The ever-increasing salinity and blistering heat have led to extreme conditions for some of the wildlife that lives below the surface. It is a stressed environment. For example, uh, a lot of the game fish that used to be in the Salton Sea, the uh, corvine and the croaker, have died out. The Salton Sea is like a fish tank that you might have at home that, that you sustain by plugging in your filter and running your pump to oxygenate the water. Uh, the, the Salton Sea is a contained environment like that, except it doesn't have the benefit of a, an oxygenator and a filter to filter out all the waste products from organisms living and dying in the Salton Sea are producing. Specifically, those, those byproducts of organic decomposition are hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. Well, those two components of organic decomposition are accumulating and it, it's stressing the environment and uh, so far has uh, caused the uh, extinction of Corvina and Croker in the Salton Sea. The state of California regulates all public water bodies and has not declared the Salton Sea a hazard to humans or wildlife. In spite of all the adversity, the Salton Sea remains a popular stopover for millions of birds on their annual migrations. And with the presence of those birds, it's also a popular spot for bird watchers to ply their hobby. A lot of the birds and animals come and go throughout the year, uh, perhaps just getting a little rest and food to continue them on their migration farther south or north, whichever direction they're going. Biologically, it's extremely interesting to, to see wildlife working on the edge of an extreme environment and succeeding. They do it well here. That's our show. To keep up with the latest news or to watch the segments from this or any other editions of AZ Illustrated, you may visit our website at news.azpm.org. I'm Tony Paniagua. Thanks for watching.